Well, once again, welcome. So glad that you're here. So glad that you're watching online. And uh, you might want to keep watching through to the end because we are doing uh, new partners today here at Grace Church. And we're also doing a baptism. And so, so keep watching because if I back up too far, you know what happens. So, and you don't want to miss that. So, but we, we are going to be able to share uh, and, and new people coming in to partner with us here at Grace Church. And that's what this series is about really today. We're, we're talking to, about loving our neighbors in this series. And instead of fighting with our neighbors, which I know has happened from time to time, we're asking God to use us to authentically shine the light of Jesus, to love our neighbors. And when we love our neighbors... We're simply following the example of love that God has given when he sent his son to earth. Now, in the message paraphrase of the New Testament, Eugene Peterson has a wonderful translation of John 1, uh, verse 14, referring to Jesus as the word. And he writes this, The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, Generous inside and out, true from start to finish. You see, God loves this world and all the people in it and you so much that he's willing to send Jesus to live among us. And after Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was raised to new life on Easter, Jesus then gives us uh, followers the assignment to go into the world and to freely share the love and grace that we have been freely given. And as we learned a couple of weeks ago, through the power of the Holy Spirit, alive in your life and in mine, Jesus intends to fill the universe with himself. And what is better than Jesus walking around on the earth? Well, how about a, a billion little Christs? And the meaning of the word Christian is just that. Dispatched to every continent, to every country to, to every county that makes up the world. Jesus' plan to redeem this planet is, is, full of a, is in full effect already. And we are chosen to go and are called to be part of Jesus' mission here on planet Earth to make more disciples who go and then make more disciples. And the evasion of God's grace continues right now. And the people are desperately needing the hope that has been entrusted to us to share. And this is why when Jesus was at the beginning of, of this movement, he took time to carefully model and to teach uh, loving our neighbors. One day an expert of the law was listening to, to Jesus uh, teach, and he was impressed with the, his answers. And the man was a religious lawyer, who sought to keep the 613 Jewish laws and to earn his keep in God's favor in his life. And when he asked Jesus what was the most important of all those hundreds of commands, Mark in his biography of Jesus gives this account. It says, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. See, Jesus' answer here is, is kind of his greatest hits mashup of the most important commands of the, of the Jewish history. Uh, the beginning of Jesus' answer comes from the single most important prayer that the Jewish parents taught their children. It's called the Shema. And the Shema means to hear. And these same words of Jesus are found in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and faithful the Jews that were instructed to pray this prayer when they lie down and when they raise up. Uh, Jesus then places a second command from Leviticus 19.18 about loving your neighbors as yourself. Alongside the Shema, Jesus is teaching that loving God, loving yourself... And loving our neighbors are inseparable. 
Before we move on, let me briefly remind you of the, that the order that Jesus' words are important. First, we love God. Then we, we love our, ourselves. And this is not self-indulgence or selfishness. It's, it's that letting the love of God fill our lives. So much so that we want to share it with others. It's bad grammar, but so true that you can't give what you ain't got. And this series is about sharing out of the abundance and power given to followers of Jesus that we have to share with others. So for the next five weeks, we're going to look to the Lord for wisdom, power, patience, opportunity, and strength to love our neighbors. And this means the people that live close by or maybe down the, the hall or maybe down the street. It means, it means people who we come into contact with throughout our regular life. And we'll see uh, loving our neighbors really doesn't have boundaries. So let's begin today by considering first just how to see our neighbors. Loving others begins with seeing people as just that, people. And this is what Jesus taught us and modeled for us. And there's a meaningful and powerful story found in the biography of Luke who wrote about Jesus uh, making um, his last trip into the capital city of Jerusalem. And Jesus had indicated earlier uh, that he knew what awaited him when he got to Jerusalem. And he had told his 12 disciples that he would suffer and die and Jesus was indeed a, a, a dead man walking. From Luke chapter 9 all the way to Luke 19, this physician turned author named Luke carefully records Jesus' final trip to this important city. And we pick up the story in, in uh, chapter 19, verses 41 and 44. Look with me as it appears on the screen. But as Jesus came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. And there are several important parts to this story. And we're going to spend some time taking it apart together. So when the teaching team met and we studied these passages together for hours, we believed that this account of Jesus teaches us that we begin to love our neighbors when we follow this principle. Don't just look, see. And I think we can agree that there's a difference between looking and seeing. The dictionary.com says the look means to turn one's eyes towards something. But to see is far more involved. To see means to turn your attention to. And we look at a lot of people in a lot of places throughout our day and think little or nothing about it. But when we see, when we Give someone or something our attention. When we see, we engage. We investigate. We notice. We care. And this is why American poet and writer Henry David Thoreau said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. When it comes to loving our neighbors, we must first see them. And that's why Luke is so careful to point this out in the story that we just looked at. Throughout the ministry, Jesus saw people. Look again at Luke 19, 41a. It describes Jesus' approach to the city. It says, but as Jesus came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead. Jesus saw the city of people. He fully saw them. And in seeing them, he fully loved them. All of them. The good, the bad, the ugly. So let me say it again. Don't just look, see. Before we talk too much about them, let's talk for a moment about this, about us. For me to see anyone requires that 
I have to slow down and also be quiet. Seeing requires uh, a humility, and sometimes I find it hard to live that out. Uh, uh, I, to, to, to see means to be quiet enough and be relaxed enough to see people as people and not positions or labels. We need to, that we would need to debate or to judge. So am I the only one that struggles with this? We are increasingly polarized world here, and, and I can easily get caught up in it all. I've noticed something about myself lately that God is wanting to mature in me, and God is asking me to lay down something that I've held on to, and I find it hard to let go of. It's one of my hardest habits I've ever had to break. Are you ready to share? I'm going to share it with you. It's my addiction that I'm right. And I hate to say it, but sometimes the word always goes before that right. Pray for me. So in these days, God is teaching me discretion. Author Pete Scazzaro defines direction this way. Dis discretion is the patience of waiting with prayerful expectation to see what will unfold. To know when to leave things alone because our interference will only complicate things. With dis discretion, we can say, I don't know, I'm waiting on God. God is pointing out to me that I don't know nearly as much as I think I do. And from God's perspective, and this struggle is actually quite funny, because you don't know this, but sometimes I'm a legend in my own mind. What I mean is, well, when it comes to the pandemic, I've read a few articles, I've watched uh, documentaries, I've, I've watched webinars with infectious disease experts, and so in my mind, I'm a board-certified uh, epidemiologist. I, I, I'm, I'm right. I know it all. When it comes to social polarization, I've read a few things, and I've watched a couple of YouTube videos, and in my mind, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I'm right. When it comes to the election, I've watched the debates. So in my mind, I'm an expert on public policy, and guess what? Yep, I'm right again. But God has also been working on my heart to remind me that the call on my life is not to try to always be right but to seek first the kingdom of God and Jesus' righteousness. You may want to ask God if you need this too. To love our neighbors means first that we need to see them. We don't need to debate them. We don't need to avoid them. We don't need to judge them by what it says on social media or bumper stickers. We don't need to win. To love our neighbors in these days means that God may be asking us to just cross the street or cross the aisle or cross the lines of even a protest so that we may see a person like Jesus does. So remember, don't just look, see. Let me push a little deeper in the idea of seeing. Don't just look, see the beauty and the brokenness, both of those. How do you view people? Be honest. Are, are you, are you um, suspicious? Are you fearful? Are you judgmental? Or maybe you're on the other side. You're optimistic. And you're codependent like me. And sometimes give people a pass out of fear of conflict. Now I'm sure it depends upon the person or the circumstances. But my hunch is that all of us have some predetermined idea when it comes to people in general. And one of the best things about Jesus is that he saw people for who they were. He could spot a fraud a mile away, and he also could see a wounded soul in a crowd of thousands. He knew those that were filled with doubt, and he knew those that were filled with faith. And sometimes, like the disciple Thomas, it was both at the same time. Jesus saw both beauty of people made in the image of God and the brokenness of people marred by sin. So how do you see people? Do you see both? Our view of the Bible can deeply influence our view of other people. Remember that the story of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 
that tell us that people are made in the image of God. And God seeks a relationship with people in the world unstained by sin. But then Satan and selfishness in Genesis 3 presents the problem as Adam and Eve dis disobey God and, and go their own way. And the order of the story is important because in every person there is often well-hidden or neglected reality that they are created by, in the image of God. That was first, before anything else. And we cannot view people through the lens of only Genesis 3. People are first and foremost not sinners. People are created in the image of God, our good God. But we cannot ignore the story either that every person has their own story of Genesis chapter 3. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this mature view of people from the Bible can help us see both beauty and brokenness in people. We're all a mixture of, of faith and fear. We all are a mixture of both majesty and a mess. And if we will just stop and see, we will discover in every person the stories and hardships and the happiness in their lives. Loving our neighbors begins by seeing both the beauty and the brokenness of people. So don't just look, see. Thinking more about this, seeing also means it involves us to see with compassion. Let's consider more about seeing together. As, as Jesus approached the city, he not only saw the people, but he actually had an experience there. Luke 1941b gives us this commentary. He began to weep. Jesus began to weep over the city. Jerusalem had people who loved him and people who despised him. And Jesus was heartbroken for the followers and his, his enemies. Jesus loved those who shouted Hosanna and for those that would shout crucify him. He loved them. And the word weep here is, is a very interesting word in the Greek the word, it doesn't, it doesn't mean just a few tears. It's used to describe the mourning and wailing and lament. It's, it's a deep inner sadness of grief. It's the same word that's used in John 11 when Jesus stood before the tomb of his friend Lazarus. And Jesus wept. It's the type of weeping when the soul erupts in brokenness. It's, that, it's in this moment that Jesus weeps for what might have been as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Matthew pushes this lament further, having Jesus say, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. The people were so near, but yet so far, so close and yet so closed, almost persuaded, nearly convinced, such potential, such possibility, such opportunity. They were 50 yards from a miracle, but they were not. And so sad that it makes, makes me want to cry. Jesus wept. If you only knew what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes, he cries, for what might have been. Jesus also weeps for what is going on and what is going to be. In our story today, Jesus announces that right now the the prince of peace is present, but soon an enemy will be at their gates. The days will come when their enemies will, will close in on every side, and they will not leave one stone on another. In the year 70 A.D., an army led by the Roman general Titus invaded Jerusalem, uh, raising the city, destroying its glorious temple, brutalizing its rebellious people, leaving not one stone upon another. Jesus weeps over what is to be. Now, it's not politically correct to say, but there is an eternity, my friends. And people will spend eternity 
either with God or without Him. And it's never our job to determine who goes to heaven or not. That's God's job. It's our job, like Jesus, to see people through the eyes of love, be heartbroken by the, their condition, and point them to the way of peace. And today I believe that Jesus weeps over Fort Myers or whatever city you may be watching from. Jesus weeps over the people who do not know his love. Jesus weeps for the children who are neglected, unwanted, or abused. Jesus weeps for the people who are, uh, who are living aimless lives. Just He weeps for people who are trying to hang on. Jesus weeps for the victims of the epidemic of COVID and for the epidemic of loneliness. Jesus weeps for those who are living to and headed to hell. And the question is not, does Jesus weep, but do we? Do we ask in prayer for eyes to see with hearts of full compassion? Don't just look, see. One more thought about seeing. See the redemptive possibility in all people. Just before the story of Jesus weeping over the, the city in Luke's biography, we have the story of, of Zacchaeus. He was a despised tax collector who was short in stature and short on friends and short on a future. That was until Jesus came by his town one day and watching, wanting to catch a glimpse of Jesus, Zacchaeus climbed up a sycamore fig tree and, and waited for Jesus to come by. And his shock, the surprise of the entire town too, Jesus called him by name and invited himself over to his house. This love and grace transforms Zacchaeus' life. And he was transformed, as Jesus announced, today salvation has come to this house. He had come to seek and save those who were lost. So don't just look, see. Got some more things for you to see today. Today we have some people that are actually putting this into practice. Today we have some, some people that have decided that they want to be partners with us here at Grace Church. And so at this time, I invite Garrett and Fluffy to come up because we've got some liturgy that we're going to do. Well, first we're gonna we're gonna do the um, the membership or the partnership vows, and that's gonna be up on the screen. So I I invite you guys to to be here that um, we can we are going to do this here. Okay. Do you hear in the presence of God and of this congregation renew the solemn promise and vow that you made or that was made in your name at your baptism? All right. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and pledge your allegiance to his kingdom? Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scripture as the Old and New Testaments? Do you promise according to the grace given you to live a Christian life and always remain a faithful partner of Christ's holy church? Will you be loyal to Grace Church and uphold it by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? Will you... Will you partner with us as we partner with God in transforming people from unbelievers to fully devoted disciples of Jesus to the glory of God? All right. We rejoice to recognize you as partners of Christ's holy church and bid you welcome to Grace Church. Now with you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And that's important, guys. It really is. This is a promise we make to God. You're not making it to me. You're not making it to the person sitting next to you. You make it to God. So we welcome our new partners once again. Now, Fluffy was baptized when he was a kid. 
And you, you do it once and it takes. You can reaffirm it if you so desire. Uh, today, Garrett is going to uh, be baptized. So, so we're going to go around here. I'm going to invite you to step in. <laughs> and hopefully the ice cubes have all melted. They have. All right. And uh, let's see. I, I, there's some liturgy here. Do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? I do. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life? I do. Do you desire to be baptized in the Christian faith? Greatly, yes. Will you then obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same way? all the days of your life. Great ever, yes I will. All right. So friends, um, Garrett uh, wrote a little something out that Dan is going to read here before we dunk him. Well, where was I before Grace Church? Put it simply, I was lost. Psalm 1-1 says, Oh, the joy of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. You see, that was me. I dwelled in dark thoughts and places. My life was just one big pattern. Anger was deeply lodged in my heart. Hate for everyone and anything was a way of life. It's almost like I enjoyed that life. If you looked at me the wrong way, well, let's just say I was not a very nice person about it. I realized that the more I lived like that, the more depressed and miserable I became. Looking at myself in the mirror was not fun. Luckily, God had plans for that to change. On August 26th of 2015, I sat in my room with my pocket-sized Bible, sat on the top of my TV. It was creased on a page that I thought was pretty weird. I opened it to that page and it was creased on and was on that first page of James. At that time, while I was reading, I realized I was the double-minded man that was being spoken of, unstable in all his ways. That deeply, deeply troubled me and I cried out to God in hopes that he would turn this around. That changed my life that day. James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Where am I now? Well, I am currently six months into my anger recovery. <laughs> working on 12 steps and with the Choose Recovery Program. I've had, had my life given to Christ for five years now, and most of the time I'm happy to say that I am looking in the mirror now. Except in the morning when my hair is all messed up and I look like a zombie. <laughs> I help the church with their food deliveries and my friends call me when they want to talk about Christ. I am a deeply broken person getting stitched back together beautifully by Christ. I am a joyful worshiper and want nothing more than to be fully devoted disciple of Christ. I am now free from many things that have plagued me. I am such a blessed, blessed person that has the Holy Spirit dwelling within me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Now, the reason I want to be baptized, to put it simply, I will give you a Bible verse, 1 Peter 3, 21. And the water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. At this time, I'll, I will leave us with another Bible verse, Romans 8, 37, 39. 37. No, in all these we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 38. 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, <laughs> neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. I'm going to have you bend your knees a little bit and cross your arms up over your chest. You can hold your nose if you want to. Okay. Okay? All right, Garrett, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! Let me pray for you. Well, Father, we thank you. We rejoice in this celebration. Lord, what you've done in Garrett's life is not unlike what you've done in thousands of lives, but each one is unique. And Lord, we know that there's more in store for him. Lord, you have a purpose and a plan for his life that we can't even fathom at this moment. So Lord, I just ask that you would help Garrett live into that. Lord, help him keep on track and going the ways that you would desire him to go. And help all of us to also come alongside him and be that loving neighbor that can help in all that he does. Thank you, Lord, for Garrett. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So now that we have splashed water all around, the, the guys are going to come back up here and touch the microphones. And uh, hopefully no one will be electrocuted. But you can. All right. So anyhow, I invite you that to not only live into what we've talked about by, by being neighbor, but in order to see, to see people. But I also invite you to come alongside each other and to help each other see that person next to them and to see each other. Now, during this next song, the last song, you might want to spend some time in prayer about that, about asking God to help you not just look, but to see those people around you and what your next steps are in their lives and in your life. So I invite you to here to, to stand and worship. And those of you at home, uh, you can pray right where you are. God will hear you.